Okay, it is 5 at 1 p.m. on Monday, December 19th. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. All commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan and uh, Beth Essery and Ken Nolan and Ken St. Amor and Steve Farman and Sean Enterline and Jackie Lemmer. Lemmer hurt? Yeah. Wow. Right. Okay. Did I miss anybody? Okay. So we have a quorum. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, uh, then we'll continue with the agenda as it is. Um, we have to do approval of prior minutes. So we have minutes, we have two sets of minutes. We have minutes from the uh, 21st of November meeting. Are there any revisions to those minutes or a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Okay, and then Mike also sent out minutes for our special meeting um, last week. Um, where is this? Yeah, very short. I'm just, well, I'm just pulling it up. I have some things printed out and some things not. So this is from our meeting of December 12th. Um, is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Then the minutes are approved. I also note that Brooke Dingledean has, has joined the meeting as well. Okay. Um, the first item on the agenda is a follow up on AMI. Jackie, thank you for all of your work on this. Are there any questions, comments? Um, I have a question. How does it all um, total up now? When I look at the, the sheets, I printed them out. I just want to make sure I'm reading them out. The, so, the bottom, bottom line for each year, how should we look at that? Is that the sort of net, net, net savings each year? Uh, so do, if you want to look at the net sum, benefit summary page, Roger, uh -huh. you'll see. Um, Can you share that across. and walk us through it, Jackie? Yeah. Sure. Oh, I, I need, you to, need to be uh, the host disabled the screen sharing. Yeah, hang on. Okay. Got it. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. I am on the page that says net benefit summary, where we have the total costs over the 15 year period. Year one is up at the top from rows five to 18. The remaining of the 15 years is row 22 to 28. Um, and then the summary of the benefits and the cost benefit ratio is now 2.6.26. So the simple, so the simple payback period. Correct. Is what is what now? Is 0. 0.26. No, 0.26. No, how many years for the payback? Five, four years. That's on the oh. cash. Is that the cash flow? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hold on. Is it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you look over here, I mean, your payback period is, you know, forty-six really, years. Yeah. It doesn't really make it's out of sight. <laughs> yeah. We basically took away. Um, so what we did was. On the cost side, we did, instead of using 100 meters per year, 
we reduced that to 35 meters per year purchase starting in year two. So that discussion was with Mike replacing the 50 that you buy today. Um, so that lowered cost just a, just a little bit. Where, then, which, which page are you on now, Jackie? I'm on net benefit summary. Okay. The one cost change we made and every, all of my changes in this version are in red, are highlighted in red font. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the one change that we made on the meter replacement life cycle is to go down from 100 to 35 per year, starting in year two. So that did reduce our costs just a little bit over that 15 year period. But if you recall, we were Mike today is buying 50 meters per year. Um, so we're reducing that to 35. Mike thought that that was the reasonable number to use starting in year two. And in terms of the annual cost, it, um, this does this have interest, the borrowing cost? Um, only on the net PV, the NPV. Okay. And and what was the interest rate that was used? Um, we used uh, seven percent. So that's how much a year in interest yeah. expense. Yeah. So. What is it? Um, I mean, and that's is we that, just is that the that. discount rate or is that the oh, is that oh, the interest? Oh, yeah. Expense? Sorry, that was the discount rate. Yeah, we didn't yeah, look I'm, at the financing. We, we did we did not look at the financing. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, I know that that wasn't part of your mission, no. but. And Ken was going to look at that for us. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't have an interest rate at this point. We met with the bank on Friday. We they're making one final change to the loan documents to address the um, public utility commission filing. So I'm supposed to hear back sometime this week as to what the final closing date and interest rate is going to be. Okay. So in my view, just for the benefit of all of us to make sure I'm thinking about it right, is that we now take the work that we've got and we take this number for year two, three, and so on. Yes. And then we, I think to think about it properly from our standpoint of, in terms of, you know, what would it, would the impact be on our total financial picture and how much of a rate impact would it have on our rate payers? We take this number and then we'd add the interest cost for the year. And that would be the chunk of money we have to cover somehow. So, so Jackie, I, I apologize for asking this here, but I want to yeah. verify the number, the cost side you're showing. Does that include any grant money from the state? No, no, no. grant money in this. So we'd have to we'd have to deduct the grant money off as well. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so maybe what maybe this would be teed up, Ken, for you to assuming none of the commissioners have any issues with the work done and it kind of reflects all the time we put into it. So I don't have any issue with it is maybe you take this Ken and you apply the grant and you apply the interest expense and then we can see what it does to us. And then Jackie can actually plug the grant. And what we do about right now. Yeah. What's that? I had Jackie throw the grant money into it when we were talking last week. She can do that here and you can at least see what that does to the 60 year number. It increases the yeah, 0.26 up to a 0.55 or so, as I recall. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and I think what we're interested in is just how many years, what's, is it, how many years to pay back? Does well that also depend though if we're I mean because right now it's it's all the costs are are heavily front end loaded mm -hmm. they are um, and if we are financing it rather than then those costs would be spread out over time so it would be helpful to see what that looks like because I think that's really where we're going to see the rate impact. Well, that, that's what I was getting at. Um, what I was suggesting is take the take the take the interest costs 
and apply them to the benefit that that will bring down the benefits. But the key will be if it brought the benefits down to that zero, then and, and that included the amortization of the debt, assuming the loan was being amortized in seven years. So it was interest in amortization. And you and if it came out at zero, we could say, well, this isn't the greatest use to money ever, but it has no rate pressure. But that's, I think that's right. I think that's that. And that's so it's a that's really simple, stupid way to look at it. I, I don't really mm -hmm. need to look at NPV or look at IRR. It's more like mm -hmm. right. for our job is, you know, how much cash, what's the cash impact? Yeah. For if we pull the trigger on this, what's the cash impact? But and and you know how and that's probably the place that's the place where we have to make the decision, right? I, th I think it's the cash impact, but I think uh, I agree that it is, but it seems to me that we still have some numbers, at least on the costs that are softer numbers, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, um, the meter installation cost, mm -hmm. which we've got 150,000 in there. And if it's done um, by current staff, even mm -hmm. if there's some additional overtime associated with it, which I would think wouldn't be a whole lot, um, that brings the cost down. And True. it could be useful but I, to I see. I suspect the sensitivity will be fairly low, though. You I know, don't know. It's it's ten percent. Depends what the, of the interest up, rate is, of course. But you know, it's ten percent of the upfront cost. More than that. With the amortization and the interest, yeah. We think we can get how much from the state? Half? Was that the number I heard last time? Yeah, we've, uh, BEPSA has applied for a 50% match from the state for all of the members. And we're waiting for the official word, but from what comments I'm hearing through the grapevine, it's looking pretty good that we're gonna get that full 50%. Is there any possibility, um, Ken, to, make an argument for Hardwick Electric that because we have the burden of unfavorable topography and higher cost to implement, that, that in order for it to fly for us, we need a larger share of, of the subsidy. I know I that could, puts you in a hell of a position. I know yeah, that's problematic. Yeah. To you be frank, that would be a VEPS of board conversation. I, I don't yeah. think we're going to get any more than 50% of our total project from the state. Right. So, so it's really how it's, it, it's sort of how it's allocated. Yeah. And our problem is we're the high cost implementation. And so the financial impact for us is the worst. And yeah. yeah. So it, it I've got to be honest, though, Roger, nobody else nobody else looked at the benefits the way you did. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the first thing we would run into is trying to get everyone to agree on what is the proper benefit calculation. Well, what they could do, what they could do is simply look at what the cost to implement per customer is. And, and allocate you know, on an equalized basis. Allocate on the cost to implement per customer. That in capture, and that doesn't get us down into the weeds of debating or indicating. But that, you know, we can we could wait until we have all the numbers. But maybe that's we. Are you under the gun now, time wise? The clock ticking? No, I, I think I was, I was going to suggest that we take this away, do the financial piece of it. Yeah. Uh, bring it back in January. I sh will definitely have the interest rate nailed down at that point. I should have an idea of what the state's gonna give us for the grant money. And we can bring this back um, at your January meeting. And I mean, Mike Mike is free. I'm gonna have to report out what we get for a grant. And Mike is yep. free to argue for Hardwick that some other allocation method should be used. That's really a board conversation. That's not a staff issue. Yeah. Well, I for think, us- I think that's gonna be a hard, 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 hard sell. 
but, oh, but that's the, why we want you to do it. <laughs> but the grant is going to VEPS and not to each of the individual utilities. Is that is that a foregone conclusion? The the grants already been closed. Okay. The state gave about ten days for people to file application, okay. and uh, I know that. We put in an application for all the members based on what we had testified in the legislature previously. Um, and I know the two co-ops, uh, WEC and VEC, put in together oversubscribed is $8 million available. And, and there was more than $8, $8 million in requests. Um, and we've been pushing hard on the DPS to give us the full 50%. I, Think we're pretty sure we'll get that. Right. That what, do we, what do you think, Lynn? I mean, let's just look when Ken has it, we'll put in the interest. Yeah, it, no, it, I would, it's not I, just interest, it's the, the loan payment interest in. Yeah, it's it's the carrying, it's the whole, it's the whole debt yeah. service. It's the yeah, debt just, service. just to put it in perspective, our six hundred thousand dollar loan over 15 years at five percent is around five thousand a year. I mean it's five thousand a month times 12. No, it's 60,000 a year. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I think we need to see what the what the numbers look like because that 60,000 of the trade-off on that is is <laughs> reducing the upfront piece. But I would also like to see what this looks like with a smaller meter installation cost. Mike, if you could come up with something closer to an out-of-pocket if we do it internally. And also, I don't know what others re reaction is, but I, I'm used to seeing an eight to 10% contingency, not a 15% contingency. I'm, I'm, I, I see plenty of 15s, but do I you? can't argue. No, but to, my world is different. So I trust your, I trust your experience in the utilities world more than mine in more of a, a, a traditional well, I, corporate. I, you know, I don't know, Mike, what your thought is on the contingency. I never use less than 10, so 15 sounded good to me. Yeah. In this environment, a little spooky, you know, we're such, yeah. such a right. place. Okay. With, yeah. So, Ken, uh, have you guys uh, looked at other sources of funding, like a lot of the DOE grants, the rural uh, electrification improvement stuff? Because that uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can see a grant application being constructed that would address this exactly this type of thing, whether it's you know resilience or uh, grid innovation or uh, I, I don't. Are you aware of the? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, RFIs coming up in January. Yeah, so we, we've hired an outside grant consultant. Um, company called McGuire Whitney out of Washington, D.C., and asked them this specific question. Because um, when we went to the legislature seeking funding, that's the first reaction we got is why should the state put money in when the feds have got all its billions of dollars coming? So we asked that consultant to go through uh, the IAJA, ARPA, the R IRA bill hadn't been passed at that point, but they went through IAJA and ARPA and came back and concluded, gave us a report that we shared with the legislature that it was unlikely that we would get AMI funded. That DOE seems to be, from the way they're structuring these grant offerings and the programs, the DOE is premising it all on AMI essentially being installed already. Um, so not to say it's not possible. I think I think putting in a, a grant application is certainly something we can do, but we were warned that federal funding, number one, would be unlikely uh, for AMI, and number two, given the way the, the programs were structured, um, getting funding would be potentially multiple years. So what was was the was the advice based on an exclusive uh, I mean a request that exclusively for AMI? I mean if if it was constructed as a necessary um, as a necessary initial component to being able to 
do derms aggregation, for example, or Vince, uh, Vince, or Vince, 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 we've got a lot on our agenda for tonight. We have to, we, you know, we still Lynn, have Lynn, I, I, the right case. Is this is Vince, talking Vince, about funding. Vince, no, don't cut, cut me off, Lynn. This is talking I'm about cut funding. You off. Vince, stop it. This is talking about funding for uh, uh, right now. About a huge expense all, for hydroelectric, and I'm, Mike, I'm trying please, to investigate some funding Vince, that may be able to provide financing for it. We can discuss that on another occasion. Right now, I think we know what we need to see because right now we've got, we're looking at something that is deeply in the hole or at least appears to be. And so we wanna see what it looks like with, with financing and then see where we go from there. And if there are grants and if there's something that makes sense for us to apply for, we can certainly do that. But right now, we don't have any of that information. It's pure speculation. And we still have rate case stuff, which is urgent, and power supply, which is urgent, and a discussion with Brooke, which is urgent. Right. So um, I, think, I think we should move on. Unless there's any other analysis that we need for Jackie to be doing, we should move on with the agenda. Okay, I don't hear anything. So um, the next item on the agenda is the upcoming rate filing. Okay, so the only other thing, the you wanted to see the numbers with uh, the financing. You want me to get a new number for us installing the meters instead of the 150K Jackie used. And we're gonna have to install the actual number of the percentage that we get in the grant, which right. is planned, it planned now to be 50, but it could be as low as 40 if something went awry, right, Ken? Okay. Yes. Can we see the numbers in both cases then? Okay. Right. Okay, Steve. Walk us, Steve and Ken and Sean, <laughs> walk us through. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> I'll start if I'm smart enough to share my screen. I thought I would start, let's see, I'm not going to back up and talk a whole lot about, I don't think I need to talk about process, how a rate case is put together. We start from a known and measurable test year. We make known and measurable adjustments to it, which means things that have happened are things that you can document. You add those together, you come up with your, your rate year cost of service is the, the basic process. Um, so where I thought I'd start. So can I can I jump in for two seconds, Steve? Sure. Can you just speak to the strategy on, you know, section A of the rates process is what we're doing right now. Section B would be uh, the design, including our monthly charges and all that, which really isn't in play right now until this section A is complete. Can you just speak really high level to that kind of perspective? Okay, um, broad process wise, um, there's really, there's kind of, to a full rate case, class cost study and rate design, there's kind of three phases. The, the thing that we're used to calling a rate case is really probably should be called the revenue case. Um, Perfect. It's designed. It's designed just to set the revenue requirement for the utility in total. Once you've established that, then you you move on. Your next step, if you're going there, would be to do a class cost study, which takes the cost of service that was established in the the revenue case and um, splits it out in a whole lot more detail. What's a 30 or so line summary cost of service schedule in a revenue case becomes, I don't know, close to a thousand lines of detail in a, in a class cost study. Um, think of it as a matrix with cost categories or cost details down the left-hand margin, and then going across a page 
uh, you have columns for each rate class. And you take the total company costs and you use, you apply various allocators to different categories of costs to allocate them across the different um, classes of service you have, you know, residential, small commercial, large commercial, whatever you got going on. That phase establishes a class cost of service. It takes the total company cost of service and it assigns and allocates a certain amount to residential, a certain amount to commercial, and so on, streetlights to all your rate classes. And so that you have a, a revenue requirement for each rate class. The third and final phase really is, is the rate design, which kind of becomes part art and part science at that point. But you take the class revenue requirements that you established in the second phase, and you, you basically figure out how to recover those costs from each class. Um, so you set customer charges, demand rates, energy rates, um, you know, whether it's a flat energy, whether it's time of use, whatever. You, that's what happens in the third phase. And, and of course, this is all done using um, test year load data. Um, you don't project, you don't speculate. So, <clears throat> you know, you take like your, your, your actual residential load from your test year, and then you take the residential revenue requirement and you, you basically kind of guess and, and, and mess around a little bit with the customer charge, the energy charge, the demand charge, until you find a combination that when applied to those test year billing determinants, it adds up to the revenue requirement established in part two. Um, and that's, that's basically the three phases. What Perfect. We're working, what we're working towards right now, right here, is the revenue phase. And <clears throat> before before somebody suggests that we do it all at once, um, that can be done. Um, the department usually tries to discourage us from doing that. But for you guys, potentially, the reason to not do that is if you want your new rates, overall rates in effect, soon you do not want to get into a class cost study right now because the way the statutes work you can implement your when you file rates and you file a revenue case you can implement those rates in 45 days but there's a requirement in section 226 that says you have to apply that rate increase in equal proportion across all your rate schedules and why wouldn't that be our starting action anyway is just to do the 10 percent or 13 percent across all just do it uniformly it would i mean that's that is where you should start sort of simple the, the danger the danger you're going to get into if you try to do both together is if you file initially with a class cost study rate design where you're, you're where you're changing the structure of the rates not just implementing an increase proportionately Mm -hmm. You you lose the ability to implement within 45 days. Yep. Well, that makes it easy, I think, speaking for all of us, <laughs> I think we, we don't, we have to implement within 45 days. So if that guides us to proportionate, that's where we are. And you, we can always, we yeah, can always file yeah. for a change of structure at some later date, right? That that would be what I'd recommend. Because yeah, I just you, you you nailed it, Steve. I just wanted you to show and, and briefly explain the the areas and that we are in area one, and that's where are. our focus is, and that's that's what you're going to yeah. talk about tonight. Yep. Yeah. But but we got to get you. We got to have you need from us a decision on the other areas, the structure area, in order to move as quickly as you want to yeah. move. Yeah. Yeah. No. no, no. So, so let me let me say it differently, Roger. So, strategically, if you do the what Steve's calling the revenue case or the rate case, 
then that's your decision tonight. Mm -hmm. And the only restriction there is whatever percentage you determine has to be applied to all of your rate components equally. So residential weight would go up 10% oh, right. commercial. The class cost of service, which is the phase two here, and it can be done completely separately. That's a much more detailed, I mean, you have to go into the granularity of how your utility operates and your cost structure. And you're gonna get into conversations around what are the loads by, by customer class and what are the load shapes by customer class? So ideally, uh, I think we had this conversation last week on the AMI. Ideally, you would have the AMI data coming back for some period of time for a year, I you know, likely. So then you can see what the lo load shapes for each customer class are before you start allocating the costs out. So tonight, we really want to just focus on that revenue case discussion and then the cost, cost of service would be something you take up probably after you make the decision on whether you're going with AMI or not, because that would that would impact your timing on when you want to do things. Maybe, maybe we never do it. That's true. Uh, I mean, there's some uh, utilities that haven't been in for 25 years for class cost yeah, of service. I, 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 yeah, my own personal guess is that we need to do it, but, um, but that, but I think not, this is not the time to be doing it. Um, right, that's what I'm saying. But um, and so it's 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 each component. So the customer charge, if it's a 10% increase, the customer charge goes up 10%. The per kilowatt hour charge, each block goes up 10%. Yep. Even even all the funny little things in some of your commercial tariffs, like a, 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 oh, a transformer ownership discount, a, a VAR penalty, that kind of stuff. All that. Uh, yeah, no, um, everything. all of it, every single thing was up by whatever the percent is. Yeah. Okay, so now take off from where I so rudely interrupted you. I apologize. Well, that was good. You teed that up nicely, Michael. Um, let's see. I'm sharing. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is yeah. it big enough? Big enough to read? I like it. Okay. Um, I thought I would start by since it's a Test year, one of the measurable changes that you can support and document gets you to the rate year, which drives your revenue requirement on um, type of a process. I thought I would focus initial discussion on, on the adjustments we've made to the 2021 test year that we're using. This was not in the packet. Is that, that's right? I, I don't think I saw this. It was not in the original packet. I okay. put this together over the, over the weekend because I was, well, it was rainy and lousy out anyways. I was scratching my head. So how, how do I, you know, how do I present this? It's kind of a mess. Okay. If, um, if, if, if you could send us this after the meeting, that would be great. Yeah, um, I, I sent it. it. As soon as Steve got it to me, I forwarded it all to you this afternoon, shortly before the meeting. Okay, I didn't, I didn't see it. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so first thing we did or discovered, well, it wasn't, we didn't do it in this order, but this is the order. It makes sense to look at it in. Um, there are some very big non-recurring credits in the test year. Um, settlement on the, the embezzlement case and um, settlement on a, a, a billing error fix. Those two things were $791,000. Um, so what we did was we we took that out of the 2021 basically revenue requirement. The, the, the per books original income statement reflected all that income. So it looked like you were doing great. Jeez, you booked you know a million, a million plus in, in net income in 2021. What do, what do you need a rate case for, right? Um, except this big settlement was a one-time thing. It's not going to occur next year, or the year after, in the rate year. So it was part of the process. You 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 take that out by pulling that out of the miscellaneous revenue. That increases your your revenue requirement. And then the tier is is kind of a companion to that because you had a million dollars of net income on your books in the test year. Um, doesn't mean you automatically get to have a million dollars again next year. 
um, the $727,000 reduction brings your net income down to a, a proposed $300,000 level, which um, is probably more supportable based on looking at, at a reserve. One of the problems you've got is you have very little debt on your books, no interest to speak of. And the department and the commission generally look at a tier times interest earned ratio calculation of 2.0 to decide what your net income should be for purposes of what's allowed in rates. Um, works okay when you when you have a utility that has a capital structure that you know is maybe closer to 50-50, where they are where they are using you know a significant amount of debt. Um, when there's no debt, the debt tier calculation, it produces a tiny number or, or an, an infinite nonsense number. You can't, if, if you have zero interest and that's your denominator, you're, you're not going to get a, a, anything that means anything. So the 300,000 is our, our best guess as to where, where we might be able to support a number using something other than tier. Basically, we looked at, at a, a reserve of 60 days of O&M and on one side and then on the other side said, look, we've got, I don't remember the exact number, a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash on hand, 150 as a starting point. That was, I think, a September or October balance number. Anyways, that, and if you add the proposed net income and you add back depreciation, which, which is a, I mean, that's a non-cash debit that, that generates cash for you. It's basically an internal funds generated type of a calculation. Um, and then you subtract from that um, some number that's representative of what you expect to spend on capital next year and any bond um, principal payments. What you're left with, the net of all that is a reserve. But I think in this case was about a hundred and twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars. Not very big. And you can hold that up against a 60-day um, reserve of 60 days of O and M for you guys is closer to a million dollars. So um the 300,000 is a number that gives you some reserve. And when you look at, look at a rate increase like this, you've got to look at you know, subsequent years. When the department looks at this, like if you, let's say we, we put in a million dollars for net income, right? That would give you a heck of a good reserve at the end of the first year. The department's going to look at that and they're going to say, wait a minute, with that big of a net income, <laughs> In year two and year three, if you don't come back in for, for another rate increase or reset your rates, you know, you're gonna have a, a, a two, three, $4 million reserve pretty quick. So there's, there's kind of a balance there. It's kind of subjective. There's a bunch of judgment. Could we tweak that number up or down for that matter? Yeah, we probably could some. And I'll, I'll say it straight right here. There's no guarantees. I don't know. There's no way to tell exactly how the department's going to receive that. And, you know, there just, there is no good cut and dry calculation that says this is what your net income should be. It's been the problem with utilities for 30 or more years since I've been in the business. It used to look a lot different. Well, it should look different when I was a GMP, but that's a whole different kind of calculation with an investor involved. But it's still the same issue, kind of. Anyways, that's that's where that piece is. Um, we adjusted labor expenses up by two hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. Reflects a ten percent union increase in April of twenty-two. Another 5% as of June 2023. Um, I don't know that we have any particular documentation. Usually the department either looks, well, may, maybe that's in the union contract. I think that's, okay, good. Thanks, Mike. 
I look at too many of these and I forget which is which, one case to another. And so also there were management um, non-union increases in April of 22 and a new person um, that we adjusted beginning January of 22. That person came in late 21, but um, we, we had, there's only two months of that person in the, in the test year. So we had to put the other 10 months in. Anyways, those are the things we took into account as far as labor wage um, went. I'm going to skip over the next two items because Sean's going to talk about those. Um, the rest of what we have going on for adjustments are a bunch of fairly small cats and dogs. They're pretty routine. Um, I'll run through them real quick. And then if, if you want to talk about any of them in more detail, we can. Um, but Depreciation, we, we adjusted $35,000. Um, I used Beth's plan additions um, depreciation schedule, which I think, I believe, picks up all the additions through the end of 22. So that's fairly current. Medical benefits adjustment, $31,000. Um, that's based on the latest invoices. There's a net metering adjustment that we put in. We're sort of copycatting what what WEC has been doing. They've actually gotten an adjustment like this through in the last case or two for them. Basically, it looks at installations during the test year. And in this case, 2022, the, the intervening year between test year and rate year. I don't think I said this, but your rate year is gonna start like March of 2023 because we'll get this filed January 15th, maybe a little sooner if we're fortunate. Anyways, um, so all those installations over that time period, um, some of that production from net metering, which leads to lost revenue, some of that's embedded in your test year. So what we do is we look at it, we say, okay, we have this many kilowatts of new generation. We know roughly what capacity factor those run at. So we know, we know how many kilowatt hours those things will produce in a full year. And then we also know what they did produce during 2021, during the test year, the partial year there. You take the difference and, and those kilowatt hours are going to generate, are going to create lost revenue in the rate year. And then we pick up the second piece because you got the same process in, in 2022. And you net, you net out of that lost revenue. You, you take all those kilowatt hours and you value them using your tail block rate. Yes, that's where when you don't sell that kilowatt hour and they produce it instead, you don't collect that tail block rate. So that's your lost revenue. And then we took um, that same set of kilowatt hours and applied um, Vermont Zone LMPs um, marginal energy for avoided costs. Obviously, if the customers are producing those kilowatt hours instead of you, you're not buying energy on the on the spot market or anywhere. Um, that was the most logical way to. But anyways, that's that twenty nine thirty thousand dollar adjustment. Property taxes, latest property tax bills, the payroll tax follows um, the payroll adjustment. Really, we know what the what the average what the rate of payroll taxes was from the test year. You apply that to the adjustment. It was like seven and three quarter percent, I think. You apply that, gives you the, that gives you the payroll tax adjustment. There's a small travel allowance, uh, gross revenue tax, weatherization tax. Those are calculations, basically the overall revenue increase. Um, you just multiply that by the half a percent or the point half, point five two five percent rates that you wind up paying in April. Interest expense is down a little bit because you've made principal payments, so you have less debt outstanding. It's, it's what happens. Um, and then a couple of adjustments where your, your Transco um, credits go up a little bit, partly because there was a small investment in late 2021. And just the way the financing works, as you pay down more principal, you get a larger piece of the actual Transco distribution that flows through to you guys. All that adds up to six hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. 
um, your tester um, cost of service was 6.1 million. What's well, proposed is 6.8, and it leaves it to it's an 11.37% increase that we'd file for based on what's in front of us here. There. All right. Steve, this doesn't take into account any capital uh, expenditures we have. It well, or knowns, right? It, it does to the extent that those will show up in the, in the cost of service calculation. Um, you don't, you rec when, you, when you invest a dollar in plant, you don't recover that dollar in the next year in your rates. You recover the depreciation so that you get that dollar back over the life of the asset, be it seven years, 20 years, 30, 40 years. Right, we pay for depending it. On, yeah. So that's that's where that $35,000 depreciation adjustment comes from. Some plant, some plant additions that, that occurred um, late in 21 and, and, of course, all across 22. And the, the test here has a number of capital uh, expenses uh, anyway, doesn't it? I mean, that's so that Cap uh, capital expenditure is going to your you have to spend that money to put it into your <laughs> rates, essentially. Right, Steve? Right, but what you recover in rates once you make a capital investment is the depreciation, and that may it may cause you to have higher, more interest expense in your rates if you finance it. Implicit. But you don't, go ahead, Steve, you, don't, sir. you don't recover the investment dollar for dollar. That that'll yeah, never happen. Right. You recover it over the life of the asset. That's the the curse of accrual accounting, basically. Effectively, there's an implicit assumption that that you're going to finance capital investments. Yeah, well, that's that's where the rub comes with this. And that's where that that whole calculation that you were talking about, because we haven't. Um, yeah, we wind up getting penalized. Right. There's a couple other kinds of proxy calculation that I that I could dream up that we could try to use to support whatever we wanted to file for net income. But the problem is they're they're pretty theoretic. And you're just not going to get anywhere with them, in my opinion. I think our best argument is to is to say, look, even even with the three hundred thousand, or if you bump it up a little bit, whatever number, at the end of the day, you're, you're gonna the calculation is going to show a, a fairly modest reserve by the end of the rate year. You know, whether it's one hundred and fifty or three or four hundred thousand. But you're going to compare that to if your reserve target is 60 days of O&M, and that's like 1.1 million for you guys. Um, you, you, you're looking at that and going, we're still way short of where we should be. That's, and, and when you, that, that's, that's inclusive of, of, of fuel, of, 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 of energy. Yes, it includes all your purchase power costs. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not the non-purchase power O and M. No. Yeah, um, it's it's our running cost. The department used to used to run that game on us when Ron Barons was was down there. I don't know if you knew him or remember him. Um, they always wanted to give you forty five days of O and M excluding purchase power. Um, I'm being a little more optimistic here, and I know that in discussions with with Sean Foley at the department during the wet case, <laughs> he basically encouraged them to, to file so as to achieve a 60 day reserve. Um, the problem you're gonna run into is your, your current cash balance is low enough that if you try to, if you ask for net income to the point where you would get up, get your reserve all the way up to a full 60 days, you know, next year, it's going to be an astronomical number and it'll never fly. Right. You'd have to ask for like a million dollars or more in net income or something crazy. From, from a strategic standpoint, given that we want to get this in as quickly as possible and so that we can and get as much of what we ask for mm -hmm. as we can, I, I think this is probably not the time to get creative. Um, if, if it's something new and novel, which may make a great deal of sense, this is probably not the time to do it. 
Um, yeah, um, that's my that's my sense on it. I I agree. I mean, you're already looking for you know double digit eleven and eleven point three seven was it? Yeah. Um, you can push that up a little bit more if you really wanted to. Well, the story we have also um, is that we haven't had a rate increase in what what is it now eleven years? Yeah, thirteen. You and, you and everybody else. I mean, I'll pretty much except for one or two of our members. That's that's the story for everybody. Um, everybody uh, has the same issue with the reserve. Everybody's but, been long, but we've been the longest. Mm. I, I have a couple of questions mm. on 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 these. Just wondering um, why on the medical benefits adjustment we're using the latest invoices when the new rates for 2023 are out. Um, and I would imagine they're probably higher than what we paid on the last invoices. If if we have documentation that can be put together with some kind of a calculation that 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 will establish it as you know known and measurable, that's the term. Um, right. We certainly could put it in. Um, I thought this was like the latest that Beth had. If there's, I understood well, I this to be yeah. Beth, where are you? <laughs> I'm right this here. This is a Reflex 2023. Right, this is yeah, reflex we just, we just switched yeah. providers. We just switched providers. So this should be our new cost. We Yeah, we just signed with the new provider. Um, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, wouldn't this be changes over the base year of 21? Yes, this is so, just the adjustment. So when you say reflects latest invoices, wouldn't it be the latest invoices for 2022? Because when I gave you this information, we didn't have any actual invoices for 23 yet. This is what, okay. This is, can you see this? On the, is it yep. big enough? Oh, okay. I got you. This is what you gave me. That's um, right. Okay. Exactly where this comes from. Uh, gotcha. I'll, I'll let you cover that, but. Um, so uh, I, I have. Uh, so that is our 2023 number. Yeah. Yes. These these are the there's your test year cost the 297. It was 321 I guess for 22 and then for yeah. 23, that's the 329 which is where the 318 is the difference between 21 and 23. That's yeah. what that is. So just so I understand and can extrapolate this a little bit if. If we do get this rate increase, it's going to be just under seventy thousand a month increase in 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 income. And right now, what? Uh, how much uh, uh, net loss? I, I mean, how much are we spending a month uh, that's decreasing the balance sheet? We've so been we've been uh, going through about fifty fifty five thousand a month of our cash. Okay, and that's uh, that is for the for foreseeable future. That's been every month this year, and I okay. think November and December of last year yes. as well. So I guess I'm just looking at the say it's you know sixty eight thousand here or, or so. So, and that leaves about thirteen thousand um, buffer between what we're asking for and what what are you know what our continuing net losses are. Much. Well, yeah, you've got to be careful with, with that cash number. I don't know, you know, fifty five thousand a month or whatever for cash, but what are you spending it on? Remember that. Yeah, there's some, there's some capital drain on it too. Right. I mean, which is your point. So yeah, I all of, I like what you just did, Vince, is what I did too, but then adjusting back for the I mean, capital. Yeah, your cost of service, your revenue requirement is totally driven by your income statement and whatever flushes through your income statement. Um, capital expenditures and some other things that don't hit the income statement. They may burn up your cash, but they aren't they aren't something that you get in rates directly. It's yeah, like the capital expenditures, you get it back over a long period of time. Right. No, no accelerated depreciation. <laughs> so um uh, yeah, no, you don't have taxes, so right. that doesn't help you. Uh, well, I was just thinking, Mike, in 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 the in the manager's report, you're talking about you know 
because of supply chain issues and stockpiling stuff and a uh, new substation. I mean, I just see sort of a continuing demand for uh, capital investment. Uh, Which probably just means we're gonna have to take a different approach on debt. We're gonna have to start we're going to have to start borrowing to cover our capital expenditures, which is a more normal approach anyway. That's it what the is. department's it, going to tell you. Yeah. yeah. So the when I when I joined HUD, I made it a goal of mine to not do my best to help us not need a rate increase until we were debt free, which would be 2024. Well, we got close to that, but we didn't we're quite make it. <laughs> didn't quite make it. And yes, Roger, that is what our regulators want us to do. They want us to incur the debt to do those projects. Yeah, they, they're looking at utilities in general, when they look across utilities, you know, 60, 40 <laughs> debt to equity ratio. So, you know, munis, there's that natural tension between the regulators wanting the munis to, to cover all their capital with debt service and then municipal elected or appointed officials being reluctant to borrow money and you're constantly fighting that tension. Um, the, the other piece in here that we haven't really talked about yet, um, and Sean's texting me on the side that he's got some concern about the way the power supply and res numbers are presented here, but you should be aware that that power supply portion is a negotiation with the DPS and it's presented here as kind of a firm number, but when we actually get to filing this rate case, they're gonna look at what the wholesale prices are at the time you're filing and they'll push up or down depending on what they're seeing in the market um, and what your power supply looks like. I mean, that's, that's also true for like all the other costs here, you know, but in a much smaller scale. You do get some negotiation and pushback from the department on other things. So, I mean, whatever you file, you can figure you're, you're, you're going to lose a percent or two, three. It's pretty typical. It's kind of the way the process works. Could that inform what we then do for our rate increase, the 45 day in rate increase? Should we, should, should we go with the bigger number, the ask number? And then we just we'll just have to be mindful that we may have to refund down to what they approved. Yeah. So, yeah. so what Sean was showing me on the side here is the the res program and the power purchase. Um, we think there's actually an issue in that calculation that the the power supply based on the budget should be 130,000 higher than what's presented here. And that's really reflecting, you know, what, what we're seeing in the market with the, the prices being up in January this year, for example, up to $300 a megawatt hours, what we're seeing, so. So this, this number is Sean's latest number that they reflected a new like, longer term average for market prices that we picked up on late Friday. Yeah, and I, I owe an apology here to the group and to you specifically, Steve. Um, I expected that number to be 307,000 and that the res cost is additive to it. What it looks like this schedule does is subtract res out as if it was all in that one. I didn't number. subtract res out of your number. Okay, so there's some gaps to close here. My apologies, everybody. Yeah. But the, the principles remain. Um, as Steve was just saying, I have finished some discovery. I shouldn't say finished. We filed Washington Electric's rate case in September. We filed Morrisville's just this past week. So we're starting to get feedback on what the department wants to see for power supply and specifically around price because uh, price of energy has been a uh, wild animal. Uh, it's been very volatile. So I'm using this weighted average that Steve said that I, I think is more palatable, but that still doesn't um, settle the fact, particularly in your case, that we're going to be settling this case. What do you think, Steve? Late February, maybe? You know, once the winter weather's mm -hmm. passed, in other words. <laughs> so 
price could be quite different on the back yeah. in this case than yeah. it is on the front is the point. Depends exactly when we get it filed. Sean, is part of the, the 180 looking small to you because of that number right there? Oh, that issue's crop. Okay. Now right. I get it. And what, what I didn't do, and this is probably my fault, there's there's an issue in your test year yep. where what's booked on Hardwick's income statement for power costs. And, and it shows up in the audit is different than the power costs. I'm not I'm not sure if I'm going to say this quite right, but the power costs that VIPSA build through to Hardwick. And it's just a couple of accounting things. And the upshot of it is, is that purchase power number in 2021 really should be lower. And probably this one in A and G should be higher. It's it's um, yeah, Beth would probably say this better than me, but the total income statement, the total net income is, is doesn't change. There's a classification thing between purchase power and, and if I had taken whatever that adjustment is out of this number, that adjustment, because there's the 3.8 million that, that you gave me. Yes. Still, still subject to future, you know, energy negotiations, you know, market price stuff, but um, this number, if, if I had had the chance, time, whatever, to make that adjustment, this adjustment number would have looked much bigger. Yeah, we're in lockstep, Steve. I didn't yeah. realize that bucketing yeah. issue. Was I didn't. Was. I didn't. It didn't strike me at first. Yep. Um, if I just scroll to the bottom of the schedule, still the same numbers, same totals that you saw on this uh, this adjustment page yes. that I was going through. So it so... It, it does distort the adjustment the way it appears but we would we would just make that number smaller or that number bigger and then another number somewhere else smaller so it, it is a wash yes yeah it was an issue with the way the the transco dividend payments were were booked and beth Pardon booked me. them in one place where we would normally see them someplace else so that uh, to, to answer your question though roger um I just want you to be aware, it, even if the commission approves filing for 11.37, when we get to the back end of the negotiation, as Steve described, you will you tend to see the Department of Public Service pushing down on your non-power supply costs. And then on the power supply side, they're literally going to pick the market price on a particular date and say that's what we want to base the number on. And that could be higher or lower depending on what the markets are doing as you're going through negotiations. When you say the market price, you're not talking are you, the short term, but but the the year ahead or or the period. You know, yeah. something that's going to cover the year, not 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 the daily spot on that day. Right. But the, there's a forward market that they're taking right. taking Thank into you. account. Yeah. Um, So to the extent that if if there's going to be, I think you said that 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 it seems that whatever people ask for, they get one and a half to two percent less. Should we factor that in so that the one and a half, so that after the, the ding, we're where we want to be? That's always a tough call. I mean, I mean to the extent that there are things where there's some room. Yeah. Um. And maybe those places are so small that it's not going to make a big difference, but but maybe it makes some difference. There's there, there's there's a balance in that if you if you put extra in, knowing you're going to lose a couple percent or, or some number, um, if you push any one item too far, and remember we're dealing with people at the department. It's it's not a blind bureaucracy, but if you if you appear greedy in, in the category, I'll put it bluntly. I uh, yeah, no, um, I it they'll get annoyed and then they'll just dig deeper on everything else. So there's yeah. this it's it's kind of an art. There's a balance, there's a judgment. Um putting some padding in is probably not a bad thing. It, but if you go too far, then it's hard to tell what too far is. Yeah, no, and some of the numbers are clearly, you know, are known. I mean, the union contract is the union contract. Right. Uh, 
So um, one of their favorite tricks is they'll, they'll go down through your O&M costs by FERC account. You know, all the, all the 580 series that are distribution o and &M. they'll look at every single account. They'll look at a five-year average for that account. They'll compare that five-year average to either your test year or your rate year number in that category. Usually they use the test year because you get a one-for-one -for -one, um, you know, parallel by account number. Um, and if, you're, if your test year number is like a lot higher than the, the preceding three to five year average, they're, they'll ask you discovery questions about that and they'll find ways to allow some of that. And they do that in, in, across a series of accounts. And you know, before you know it, you, you lose a percent or two. That's one of their favorite things to do. Well, and that, it's, it's really hard to offset. To, since you mentioned distribution, I, I noticed on the sheet that we did get it's not very much of an increase in distribution costs. And no. um, I was surprised by that, given that the costs of materials have gone up. Uh, the costs, and I didn't look at the FERC accounts to see which accounts are in there. Yeah. Um, but, and, and wages, I mean, I don't know if we have, a contract with, I mean, a lot of this is to A and B, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, that, that $222,000 labor expense, some of that's distribution, some of it's customer service, some of it's yeah. uh, A and G. Right, but yeah. all our tree, tip, our tree tip, trip, ugh, sorry. Tree trip, <laughs> count 394. <laughs> um, so that's not in there? It is it is in there, but we didn't we didn't make a specific adjustment for tree trimming. It's whatever was in your test year. And I think that most people that drops into account 393 or 394 or is it so it's not it's or, not in five it's not in, in the 580s and 90s. No. Tree okay. trimming would be in the 500s. I couldn't I couldn't hear you, Beth. The tree trimming should be in about the 500 accounts because oh, yeah, 300 accounts are plan accounts. Yep, it's it's I think it's 594, not 394. Okay, so it's so it is one yes. of the distribution accounts, which yeah. is what which is what I would have thought. And with the increase in gas prices over what they were in 2021, and I realize they've come down from their highest level, but there's it wouldn't surprise me if if they're asking for more and i and i don't know if if they have asked for more as a as a rate so we, we, we went up document we can't we can't it as you say it's it's known yeah we gave them the uh tree contractor a raise in 2021 and we usually do one every other year Do you contract out all your tree trimming? I'm ninety-five percent of it, yeah. Virtually. Where do you book that? Do you, do you still book that in five ninety three four whatever? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Some people put it in nine twenty three. Believe it or not, some of our members. No. Yeah. We <laughs> don't. We <laughs> don't. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> anyway, if that contract were done before we're filing. That's a known that, and measurable. We could. It's add a known it. and measurable, and it's in there. Just, just to, as I say, I was just surprised given the costs um, of everything. Lynn, you had mentioned fuel costs. Um, fuel is charged directly. It goes. It's a component of the cost of the vehicle. So some of it gets capitalized while some of it gets expensed. So all the fuel costs are not here in O&M expenses. Fuel gets capitalized, wow. That's it's, wild. It's, a, it's a cost of the vehicle. It's incorporated into the cost of a vehicle. And when we charge, a, when a vehicle is used to construct or create capital, that's where the cost goes. I see what you're saying, okay. It's an overhead. Yes. Yes. It's it's part of the yes. overhead on 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 if, if it's yeah. being used for construction, but if it's right. being used for meter reading or if it's being used for 
And I was thinking, yeah. Correct. I was just thinking of, of the tree trimming company I imagine is gonna be asking for a significant increase. So, so to make a 1% increase in what we're asking for, you gotta find $60,000, which we're really yep. not gonna find in the little numbers, but we, we, we talked before, if we go in for say 11.4% and they give us 10%, we have the right within a year to automatically increase our rates by 2% without having to go through a big process. Is that what I heard before? I think you have to wait a year yeah, you wait a yeah, year from from when this one goes into effect, and then you can do the the, the I call it the short form two percent. So in a year, we can be back up to twelve percent, and a year later to fourteen percent if we had to be. Oh, yeah. that's a that's a great reminder, Mike. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's good. you can do that. Yeah. If, uh, can you do it on multiple years, or it's only for one year after your 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 rate case? Five, and, five times you could do it. Five times in the next ten years. Right. The, the bill that we got through the legislature tried to do a balance between giving utilities completely free reign and making the, the regulators feel comfortable. And what they basically came to was, well, you could raise your rates up to 10% over a 10 year period in 2% increments. So essentially you could do 2% 2 every two years for 10 years before you would have to go back into the PUC for approval. Or you can do it all in the first five years. Yeah, you could do two percent a year for five years, but then in year five, year six, you'd have to go back in for approval with the the state. Yeah, so it seems to me we should get the best rate increase as quick as we can, not even push it out a month, because a year later we can go for another two percent, which we'll be fighting for, which may delay this six months. Who knows how long it'll delay it? Seems to me that if we want to adjust the number, and Steve. I'm going to circle you back a little here on your number nine, the net reducing the net income to 300 grand. But we know we're a 600K a month in, 600K a month out, roughly business. And if we want to have two months of reserve, I know we're not going to get there. But 300 sounds low to me. What would like 400 do? Is that too much? I don't know. Can you, you, there's a calculation right there that I was talking about. It's got the 300 in it. Um, hang on one second. Let me just make that number appear over here. It's <coughs> handy. Um, if you change that to 400,000, brings you up to 13.03. Um, the calculation I'm using, I've assumed and we can refine these numbers. Your current cash was 400 as of September. Um, that's your, I think that's your pro forma rate year depreciation. Leaves you with uh, available cash, so all of the things equal, a million two. You got 210,000 of bond amortizations. I assumed 450,000 for capital. It looks like if you look at it kind of long term, that's sort of where you guys fall. I mean, you're you're higher, lower some years. Um, yeah, that looks right. Depending, we can you can tweak that number, whatever you think you can support. This is kind of a hypothetical calculation, anyways. But that uses up six hundred thousand of the one point two million, leaves you at the end of the rate year all of the things equal. Um, you know, no other disasters or whatever. With about a half a million dollars in your cash reserve, five hundred and seventy-six thousand. Compare that to a sixty-day of O and M million twenty-eight. You're still short by half a million from that ideal level. Yeah. But I don't think you can push it too much further than that in this first year because you're going to go wait by next year. You're right. five hundred and seventy-six thousand because you you gained. What you gain about 150 grand by the next year, you're going to be up to 700 next year. Gotcha. You know, maybe you might be able to push it a little more than 400 or 50. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Do I hear four and a quarter? Yeah, well, uh, I like I like the 400. We we put this this exact calculation and format. The testimony is all written. It was filed in Morrisville's case on Friday. 
we'll we'll see how that goes. We'll, we should have a, a read on that pretty quick. See if they like the logic or not. They'll they'll the department will do their best to poke holes in it and make it smaller. But well, what's what's the uh, the time span they're looking at to, for that average cash balance? So you're saying it, it's going up like 150 thousand a year based on this, right? Yeah. I'm, so the way I did this calculation, I'm saying this this represents where your cash balance would be at the end of the rate year, which would be February 2024, March. Right, February, but what yeah. what what kind of average? What kind of span are they looking at? Five year span for it to be that that average balance, oh. or uh, or ten years. They probably wouldn't make an argument beyond like a year or two out. Okay. If we if we push this number up to a really big number, seven hundred and fifty thousand, so that you got all the way to almost to a million, right? That that's like a five hundred thousand dollar increase in in where your cash was before the rate case to where it would end up at the end of the rate year all of the things equal. I'll keep saying that because, you know, none of these numbers will come true, right? Um, but the department would look at that and go, wow, well, you're going to have a million five at, the, at one more year beyond the rate year. And two years, you're going to be two million. That's clearly ridiculous. It's, you know, they'll say it nicer than that, but that's that will be their point. Then the commission will probably agree with them. The 400... That's like a reasonable increment. It puts you in a place where that's that's not a that's a better reserve than we've come out of a rate case with any time in the last ten years, if if we can get that. Um, but it puts you in a place where you make the point. Look, it's not unreasonable. We we're about half of the target. Even if we don't come back in for rates for a year or two, we're not going to generate a ridiculous level of reserve. We're still going to be at or close, maybe a little under, maybe a little over the 60 day. I mean, remember the 60 days of O&M is going to be higher in a couple of years too. Right. So it, it's kind of a squishy calculation, but I don't really have much better logic to make this kind of a case without, without you know, hurry up and go out and do some financing, you guys, so we can get a good net income figure in here. <laughs> I mean, it's, Just a, it's as kind of... As an aside, what's the rationale be behind uh, debt financing rather than? The, the department will tell you there's two reasons. One is it stabilizes rates. It, it, it gives you a, a smoother rate trajectory. You won't have spikes in your, in your rates as you, I spend a lot of money on capital this year. I need a big rate increase this year. Next year, you, know, you don't spend any money. Rate's going to go up and down or you're going to over-recover. The other, the other reason is they'll make the, the argument that about intergenerational equity. As That's in, a legitimate argument. You know, it's people paying now for benefits that are going to be spread out over yeah, their yeah. children and their grandchildren. Yeah. Both of those arguments are hard to, to argue against with the department. They really are. Um, I mean, it's true. They, they basically, you know, they'll, they'll sound very reasonable when they say it. That asset should be paid for over the you know the life by the people that are using it. So that's, why that's why should good people answer. that are here for two years pay for it all and then you know people come along later and they got a free ride? That's not right. Now, the only argument against it being that you're paying more money. You're paying the you're paying the the finance charges. Yeah. And the the, the argument the department will come back with there is well, yeah, you're not an IOU, so you don't have a cost of equity and you don't have to calculate a weighted average cost of capital and, and apply it to a rate base and all that. But there's still a cost of equity to the municipals, um, voters, customers, whatever you want to call them. Because if those people are paying a higher electric bill, there's an, in other words, there's an opportunity cost. If your rates are higher because you're you're financing your construction with all 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 equity, right, all cash, um, then that's that's a dollar that your your customer down the street doesn't have to spend on his new car or something else. So that's that's the the counter argument you get from the department. 
there's there's at least conceptually it's kind of legitimate. It's a tough one to pin down. So yeah, we we have a little bit of time to decide exactly what you want to put in there for that number. Well, I, I'd column. like to I'd like to suggest, but 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 Lynn, maybe you've framed this out already is I'd like to suggest since the huge priority for us is to go as fast as we can, get filed as far ahead of the 15th as we can, that would it be reasonable, Lynn, for us to vote on, on this case? And if new information or new strategies or new feedback comes based on Morrisville or, or WEC or something, you know, you can always come back to us with a special meeting and say, hey, here's a better idea because we have new information. But if we could just give you a green light, we're having a vote, it's 400 in that slot, and this is what we want, we're going for 13%. Would that Wait, just take take that distraction away from you so you can do your work on our um, behalf? The way, the way some of our members handle that is the the trustees, the commission, whatever, will will give the, the manager clearance to file the rate case up to X percent. And that way, if it fluctuates a little bit, like, you know, sometimes there's a week or two between the last trustee meeting and, and the last and when you actually file. So so if, if there's a little bit of uncertainty and the, a lot of times between when the commission approves going forward with the rate case and when we actually file it, there are some discussions or negotiations that we do informally with the department before filing. That can be really, um, really helpful, really productive. When you can have a negotiation without lawyers in the room, a lot of times you're way better off. Um, anyways, that's that's a way to handle it. It's pass a resolution that says you know, Mike's authorized to pull the trigger up to X percent. And, and, that it's based, means, and it's kind of based on our review of all these details. And and that right. gives you room if you need to modify the details. Right, but you don't you don't you know it, it it puts Mike on a leash, but not too tight a one. I mean, you don't you don't have to put in the resolution that you can use four hundred thousand for a net income figure or thirty nine thousand for this. You know whatever. I mean that's what you, that's what do you think to you? Yeah, I'm I'm I'm. This is a big deal for us because we haven't done it. It's going to be, from the standpoint of our ratepayers, a big number. Mm -hmm. And I am uncomfortable with the rates being filed before we have seen the whole thing. It's no comment. It's no reflection on, on, on anybody um, at, at VEPSA or, or Mike. It's not a, it's not a lack of trust. Or, or respect for the work that you're doing, because I think you guys are doing a good job. But at the end of the day, it's the board's responsibility. And um, I think if we have to have a special meeting, we have a special meeting. Um, I was going to say, why don't could we, we get, so could get we approve feedback? this right here? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think I, well, I, I guess the question is, We've talked about some stuff with, with distribution that might drive up, that might be an upward adjustment in, in expenses for the test year. Are we sure? Uh, I, uh, we've talked about some, it's not a big adjust, I don't think it's gonna be a big number, but um, on the health insurance numbers, if um, you know the premium numbers for 2023 are out there, so if we know what the policy is, you know, that, that's that's going to be a known thing. Isn't that what we've already used? Yeah, we have that number. No, that's you the used, the, they, used they, they gave you the invoices, Steve. That's invoices for 2022, but we but we know what we're going to be paying in 2023. Is that what the 329,000 is? Yeah, yeah. Correct. So that's yeah. that's Oh, that's 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 actual for 2023. No, yes, that's projected that's... for 2023. Oh, I thought you in they've they've given us our bill and everything. Yeah, what as of the time, yeah. As of the time I generated this for Steve, 
I knew what the amounts were. I just did not have the invoice yet for 2023. We had already decided to make the change. Okay. So, so the number is right, but the number is right, but you don't have an invoice yet. Right. 2022 okay. is based on 10 months of invoices plus two months of projected. But is the 2023 projected based on 2023 numbers or 2022 numbers? 2023. That's we a pretty small numbers. increase. But if then the department there's, then asks there's no change, then there's no change. There's no change. Correct. Yeah, we just we just changed Lynn from MVP to Blue Cross as of uh, the Cross end of the year. Blue Cross's so. premiums for the same coverage are less than MVPs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what was that distribution question, Lynn? Is that really something that's an open question, or did, was that similarly? Well, what Mike was saying is that we do a contract with with A and B every other year. So 2023, presumably, our costs with A and B are going to go up. And if we do the contract before the rate case is filed, and ref I, I don't know how much... I don't know. I don't have a sense of how many. If we're talking ten thousand dollars, or if we're talking, you know, eighty thousand dollars, but it would so be our, known and measurable. Yeah, our trimming budget with A and B is one hundred and eighty-five thousand a year. So one percent would be two grand, roughly. So well, it's going to five percent would be ten grand. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to guess they're going to be looking at more like 10%. Every, I mean, every, just everything is going up. They're going to understood. Want 10%. So it's not a big adjustment, but, you know, and I, I just didn't know what else was. Yeah, if it's 20 grand, that's a third of a percent. Um, yeah. And is, I mean, is there any chance of, uh, you know, getting a contract in place in a week or two? It's really what you're oh, talking I, about. I could here. probably do that, but do, do we mean, need it? it? No, it sounds, if it's, if it's not going to, Again, I didn't know what the numbers were, so I, it just struck me that it was a very small increase in our distribution expenses. And when part of that is an allocation of our labor expenses, which are up more than 10% from 2021, what roughly 15%, right? 10% and 5%. Um, yeah. A little bit more than that when you compound it as it were the one thing you don't have is uh any any increase to non-union wages beyond no, our, policy, our policy is first of all the the distribution people are, are well the a and g part but our policy is is that our non-union staff get the same raise as 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 our union employees believe that was what we had, oh, had agreed on. yeah we didn't i think he's talking about beth and me lynn yeah i was trying not to put you on the spot there michael but, um <laughs> we picked up the, the the april 22 increase but nothing in 23 so you guys better start looking for a new job or something. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, just give more vacation. <laughs> yeah, there's we didn't we didn't put anything there. I mean, all okay. the stuff that's related to the union, you, you can you've you've got numbers in union contract you can point to to say that's no, that's measurable. Um, unless you guys want to pass a resolution this far in advance for what's going to happen to these two uh, in no, 2023. No, I don't think we want to, I don't think before we've had a negotiation, I don't think we want to do that. I was talking okay. about staff. Um, yeah, so the, the staff is all included in there. Yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah. But, but again, knowing, knowing that that's included in distribution, knowing what those increases are, thinking that there would be an increase in the same range probably for A and B. And I would assume that, you know, that transformers, as you've pointed out, Mike, have gotten way more expensive. I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, we, we may have some invoices, you know, for that, for or catalog prices, or, you know, I don't know what the backup is, but Transformers are, are more expensive. Line is more, ex everything is more expensive. And 
and it's usually not... and, transformers and lines are capitalized aren't they right yes yep so okay. once again depreciation yeah which we've, we've well but we've got as much I, as we're I guess i guess i'm not you know without looking at the individual accounts that are in there to know what's 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 in there and the other thing i heard you say steve is we got to be a little careful that once we get to 13 percent, we're pushing we're potentially pushing an upper limit and then mike's point was good that if 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 we if 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 we hit some of those expenses this year that the two percent in 12 months might be the better remedy than trying to hit hit these jacking this up to 14 or 15. There's there's some truth there. I mean, the bigger of an increase you file, the harder the department's gonna, gonna go to work on it to try to bring it back down. And what are the reference points for Morrisville and WEC? Morrisville filed for 11.25. WEC filed for 14.19. Stowe filed for something a little higher than WEC back during the summer, late summer, mid late summer. It was double digit, right? 15%. I don't know the exact number there. Um, those are the actual, well, in CBEC, what they file for 8%? 8.9. 8.9. So are those are kind of the, the reference points that we have right now. Um, so you're not, you know, you're kind of in the same ballpark with everybody. And at the end of the day, the story that we tell is, hey, this rate increase is driven primarily by power supply, um, wages, largely union union contracts. Um, those are the two big ones that we're seeing. Yep. You're you're not alone, in other words. What do we add at 400,000? 13. 13.03. That sounds like a nice number. Yeah, an hour and a half, and we still have two items on the agenda. We got yep. a long way to go. Well, well we're, it's going to be a long <laughs> meeting. That let's let's get this nailed down. This is this is this is this is important. Yep. Yeah. I, again, I looked at the FERC accounts, but but the the numbers that we have in the in the monthly report don't give me a sense of because it, it, they're not annual figures and they don't compare to a a year. So I, I but look, uh, if if the advice is that something in the range of thirteen. If we if we start pushing up much above that, in any case, we we make it more difficult. I don't know. That would be my intuitive thought. But if I it's would... a sensible number, if it's a hard, if it's a, I mean, if it's really a case of a question of the support, though, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you have if you have hard rock solid support, put it in. Yeah. It, the other, the flip side of that is, I mean, your 400,000 net income is maybe a little on the high side, but if the department starts griping about that and want to drop it, well, you can bring some of the other things in, especially if you negotiated the trimming contract by then or something, you know, you can trade net income for other information you have to support the inflation numbers. So this, there's a few ways to cut. I mean, it becomes a negotiation in art form once you get it filed. Yeah. Well, One and I think, you... and I think we're going to be more sensitive on, on our capital costs, um, and 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 financing that going forward. I yeah, you can never to... solve like the cash flow problem that's driven by you know large capital expenses with rate increases. Um, I could tell you horror stories. Of, of other members that tried that some number of years ago it's not a pretty situation but that's what we've been doing is i mean i don't know i've not tallied yeah. up what we've put into wow. look at hydro over the last year or two years but we haven't right. financed any of it right i mean and you can do that to a point but and then you eventually reach a point where oh my god i'm out of cash and i can't possibly get a rate increase big enough to dig myself out of that hole yeah that, i mean that's your danger I've seen it happen. It's not fun. Um, but at 13%. Thir I mean, 13% doesn't strike me as being a, a bad number. Mm -hmm. 
what is it that you need from us at this point, Steve? Um, or Steve and Sean. I guess if you if you were to say, file this thing at 13%, I'd get my little pen out and start writing testimony tomorrow, It'd probably take me two days. And realistically, three or four um, might be ready to file sometime next week. I don't know if that I was true. That. I can't speak for Sean. He's, he's, the power supply numbers are um, complex, complicated. Uh, I'm a detail. big shame, Steve. That's the deadline you've had me on for some time. So uh, none of this is outside my <laughs> expectations or capability at this point in terms of timing. So conceivably, we could file this puppy before the end of the month or, or by December, you know, 30th, 31st. Yeah, and remove that risk that we're going to have to be asked to jump to the next fiscal year and wait for the audit. That would be a disaster for us. We just, that would be a well, disaster. Yeah. You can file without the audit. I mean, the, the, the penalty you pay or the danger is that you get a lot of discovery questions sometimes as a result, more than you otherwise would. There's there's no statute that says you have to have the audit. Have to have, have, to have the audit. I don't see any risk. Any risk. Go ahead. Why not move ahead? Yeah. I think move ahead at 13% and in your back pocket, you get 2% next year. Right. I'm, I, I, I will form that into a motion. I was, was going to ask for one. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Roger is the I, best at doing the motions. <laughs> I move to approve the filing of a 13% rate, rate increase based on the detailed numbers we've reviewed tonight. Second. So the number that's sitting in Steve's calculation right now is 13.03. So you want it an even 13 or the 13? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Based on the detailed numbers here, so I'll, I'll repeat see, that. I move to approve a rate increase of 13.03% based on the detailed numbers reviewed tonight. Second. So, so Mike, that 400, oh, I'm sorry. 400's it. 400. Yep. Is, okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I love it because everybody that's been asking me about it, I've been telling them 14%. So if we're going to come in a little <laughs> less. I love it. <laughs> so that 400 is the one change we've made from what I sent you earlier and um, on Sunday, Mike. That's the only thing we've changed here tonight. Good. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, nice job, Steve. Well done. Thank you. Right. Thank I'm you. Gonna stop but uh, but, but oh. before this goes in, I don't know about anybody else, but I would like to see the whole package that's going in. I think distributing that to us would be yep. so important. I think we all ought to have it. Yep. I think we need to have it. I think we need to review it just to make sure sure that there's oh, nothing no. in there oh boy do you, do you well, literally we, want the whole 100 page packet which i mean clean and red line tariffs i mean I all the no i don't need the don't need the I, if i for one don't need the tariffs i mean i can i can uh, you basically want out the testimony you know what 13.03 what percent is of 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 the numbers yeah. what i what i want to see is is what the testimony is and the exhibits that go with it. The exhibits that go with it, and um, yeah, and if there's, I, you know, I've, I don't know if there's sort of a general overview, executive summary piece that goes in, or you know, I, I've not done a, a Vermont rate case, so. Yeah, um, the the testimony that I usually write is probably as close as you're going to come to a to a summary. No, that's um, fine. There's that's, a that's... we include a cover letter that basically says, "Oh, the three main drivers are," and, and a few other things. Not a lot of detail there. 
but somebody has to be making this request and i mean it's a formal request and signing something no well the cover letter that's actually the petition is what we file yeah okay and it's, yeah. And it's supported by testimony the, the petition is you know a half a page long usually it doesn't say a lot right but it's coming it's the petition is coming from hardwick electric presumably the testimony is coming from hardwick electrics experts yes yeah and a lot of times the petition is signed by the lawyer you guys you want to use eli right okay is the that, petitions are, okay so it's it's i mean you you yeah, could no, sign it fine. if you wanted that's to that's fine no, Usually that's it's, it's just a convenience thing and the commission accepts that typically. So that's that that's why I'm I'm saying, Steve, I don't know what the what the yeah the, the framework we'll, we'll we'll put it together and we'll we'll drop it on you, we'll give you a few days to look at it. That would be and uh, we'll go from there. See yeah, if you have so, more questions or so just at a high high level framework here. Um I mean, the testimony, the details change by a member, but one of the things we hear from the DPS is they like the fact that all of VEPS's filings look pretty much the same. It makes their review a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So Steve's pretty much got a template and Sean, the same thing on the power supply. They'll drop your numbers and details into the, the general template. We would normally give that it either use Bill Ellis, our guy, or in your case, you have Eli. He, he would normally be the attorney that made the filing um, using the the generic information that we've provided. Um, does does and, does typically does the does Eli or Bill review the filing the package before it goes in? Yes, and they edit so, they edit the testimony and you know keep us between the ditches. Right. And, and is, is, is Eli, has he seen any of this at this point? Not yet. Okay. So he, so just, he's finished got up, a, he just finished up with Morrisville. We've been keeping him busy. Yeah. He's okay. aware and he's, he's aligned up with us, but he has not received it yet. Okay. Yeah. He usually it, needs like a day or two to, to go through. We send him the testimony and exhibits and he goes through it and, okay. um, it all makes sense to him he usually winds up he he edits for grammar for syntax for places where he can sharpen up a few words that sort of thing um once in a while he catches uh you know an actual issue or some concept but if we've done our job he, he doesn't even have to do that yeah well if you could send it to us at the same time that you send it to eli that's probably will shorten up the yep. time yeah. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Right. On the, we did have a vote, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is this new wind resource and the 2023 power supply budget. Yep. Sean, so that's, that's you. I could give you as much or details you'd like to see, but at a high level, you have been taking about 13,000 megawatt hours a year from the Seawork Nuclear Station, and that's going to end in a couple of weeks at the end of this month. In its place, you're buying 4,000 megawatt hours next year of, of Stetson Wind, which is a Everybody. wind project in northern Maine. And the balance will be coming from uh, a PPA we did two years ago at this time, same company, uh, Brookfield, and it's hydroelectric energy. So you're going to get the same 13,000 megawatt hours. It's just coming from two renewable resources that include Tier 1 Rex instead of the uh, nuclear station with its nuclear attributes, as we like to call them. So uh, from a volume perspective, it's less certain, you know, Seabrook was base load. You pretty much guaranteed to get what you expected. Um, in the case of Brookfield Hydro, that is firm. You're going to get that no matter what the hydro conditions are. So that was that was locked in. We bought that up to kind of your base load requirements uh, throughout the year. And this wind resource is really meant to be on top of that in the power supply stack. It's intermittent. Uh, as we've talked about before, it's heavy on the winter, which is good for us. Uh, we want more winter power. And um, 
I'll just share my screen so you bring back the memory of the offer letter you saw recently. So this is the two page offer letter that that uh, I should stop and make sure you all see this. I think you can all see it. Yep. Okay. So all I've done is redline the price in the short time it took us to uh, get all the approvals. And it's not just us, by the way. Brookfield had to go through its own internal approvals here as well. Uh, the price went from a quota to 86.58 in the first year up to 91.84. So it increased by about $5 a megawatt hour. Uh, all the other terms are the same. And it'll begin January 1st. Um, kind of excited about it. When you mix it in with the purchase we did two years ago, you're really only netting up on cost by $5 a megawatt hour. And that feels good to me because you're getting a tier one renewable energy credit out of this uh, that you would have otherwise had to purchase separately had you stuck with Seabrook. So um, I know this individual contract certainly represents some rate pressure, but collectively the replacement of Seabrook feels really neutral to me. Uh, about $5 of increased cost. So can... with the with the tier one racks presently going for about 10 bucks, does this actually equate to this being about an $81 resource instead of the 91? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll take you one step further, Mike. Um, your renewable energy standard budget this year was relatively high for all the reasons that we've discussed it's primarily this tier one cost that's driving it. That's that's gonna take a breather if not go down next year. Uh, calendar 24, you will have had a full year of, of production and tier one credit starting to get delivered under these new contracts. So so I really expect your uh, your res budget, which doesn't show up in power supply to uh, go down uh, effective 24, calendar year 24. Yeah, so just thank you for the quick turnaround. Um, we've got a great counterparty here, uh, quite a different experience <laughs> than we had last summer with the other wind project. So I think it's ending well. So the so the percentage we're getting nine, you know, varying percentages of the total PPA. That's because of what our projected needs are, or or it's a combination of everybody else who's taking as well. It's it's Sean trying to do a very refined calculation to get all 11 or 10 BEPSA members in this case, 100% <laughs> hedge ratio. So it's you in context with your your peers. But the other piece of this is please remember this is intermittent. It's right. It be different than this, but that's the central expectations, 9% next year. But the total PPA amount stays the same from year to year? The percentage of the total stays the same. That's no, the percentage of the total is changing according to this. Yes, that's true. Um, My question was, was the, whether the whether the PPA projection is constant or whether there's degradation or something built in for very vari expected variation in wind. Yeah, great question. Yeah, the PPA actually goes up. So VEPS as a whole needs more power over these five years. Uh, for two reasons. One is load growth, but that's actually kind of a marginal effect. Uh, the major reason we need to step up is because the 2019 purchases we did uh, three and a half years ago are going to expire in June of 24. So we're stepping into more wind to fill in that gap uh, over time. So the PPA itself and total volume grows. Uh, we get to be a little bit more than half of this uh, project. Uh, by the by year five, we're buying half of it. And your share, your percentage share is fixed year by year by year. <laughs> so I'm sorry I misspoke a minute ago. It's not constant over the term, but it is fixed by year. Yeah. Uh, Are there other questions, Vince? Uh, so, is it, so what makes up for the inter intermittency short driven shortfall? I mean, uh, is that uh, just spot market? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and you have a, a approximate cost, you know, just based on uh, uh, wind statistics. Of, yeah, of, this uh, project was built a little over 10 years ago, and 
we use the monthly production numbers to calculate, you know, the mean and standard deviation. So we have a good sense of what it should produce, but we also have a good sense of the boundaries around what will happen in a particular month or year. It, I said this about the other project, but it's true here uh, as well. This is a very typical wind project. 26% cap factor the, over the course of the year gets into the mid and upper 30s in the winter months typically. Bottoms out in the summer. So, so what is that that marginal? What is that cost? I mean, I I don't see the spot market cost of you know calculated statistical spot market cost. So, it's a great segue. If if the commission is ready, that uh, question is more easily answered for my part in the context of the budget. Uh, every year we, you know, project the market prices at the budget time of the budget and uh i can very explicitly show you those prices steve, steve. go ahead mike's waving his hand <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> you you spoke a minute ago about the quick turnaround well my board approved the howard project but i don't think they ever actually approved this and i know i haven't actually signed the documents so i need a I need action by the board here for us to move on this thing. Yep. So I know this, the, I, I know, I know I forwarded the emails from Ken to all of you about the, the uh, bridge falling out from under him or us with uh, the Howard project and how they came back and tried to negotiate substantially different things and had been presented and that had you had approved. And this was a very close uh, second and very close replacement with somebody that we do business with and we like doing business with, but we never actually, you never actually took action on this. And that's what I need from everybody. Yeah. Is there a motion? I, I move to authorize Mike to sign the Stetson Wind Project contract. As presented by Sean. This will actually be an agreement with VEPSA, right? Oh, okay. Is there a second? And then we can do discussion. Second. Okay. Um, is this, this will again be an agreement between VEPSA and Stetson uh, or Brookfield. And then we'll, t we'll have a back to back. Is that the arrangement? Correct. Yeah, all the enabling documents are are in place so yes you'll just be approving it for vep so to pass it through to you it's the same same structure lynn that we used in the previous arrangement right. okay that's what i thought okay so that so I, it's just to clarify so the motion is for mike to sign the um agreement with vepsa for the purchase in accordance with what's in this november 8th that's a what memorandum with the um, changed indicative price. Yep. I have one, I have one question here, and that that is in the letter. It says once this PPA is executed, the price will be fixed. How do we know <laughs> how much it might vary? From I mean, it went up. You know, the PPA. The PPA has been executed at this point. Oh, okay. So the ninety one eighty four is it? It's cur it, that is fixed at this point. There, there was enough members that have signed on that I went forward and and signed the agreement with Brookfield, um, taking the risk that I'd have to reallocate some of that power to other people if if folks chose okay. not to join. Okay. Uh, that was my only question. Anyone have any other questions or comments? Looks good. All in favor of Mike signing the agreement with EPSA for the purchase of Stetson Power from through from Brookfield. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> I just lost everybody. Uh, can we get the main screen back? Um, anyway, uh, it passes. It passes. <laughs> Okay. May I pick up on the uh, 
thread of Vince's question, if I may, he had asked what the uh, you know the spot market price outlook is in the event that the wind shows up differently than forecast. Um, it's about a hundred dollars around the clock for the course of the coming year. Um, this happens to show your rate case uh, months, but they overlap, as you know, mostly with with your uh, <laughs> budget year. I'll just unhide this. So anyway, the the current forecast is for two hundred fifty, two hundred sixty dollar power for the January February months, dropping into the fifties <laughs> and sixties through the summer, and then you know it's easily coming back up. So when you average all that out at least for your rate case duration, that's a hundred dollar power uh, calendar year. It's a little higher because of this $109 power. So the answer to your question is broadly that answer Vince, but it's very dependent on what month uh, and hour, frankly, when the variance shows up. Wow. So Sean, I'm going to hit you with my usual thing. Uh, looking at the weather and the rest of the winter doesn't look like it's going to be very cold. So uh, what are your feelings about that and, uh, and what's going to happen with power supply? And did you participate with the ISO call today? Did you listen in on any of that? I regret to say I did not. I'm not okay. familiar with what the call was today. They had a winter readiness call maybe? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was on it, but I I only gathered about a third of it. <laughs> so yeah, if you were listening in on that, you know the routine. They do a three every week. They do a three week outlook of of weather and try and get ahead of any potential uh, cold snaps. And uh, they do a nice job of reporting on fuel stocks. Uh, if you didn't, as a commission, already know, oil stocks are very low on the East Coast compared to historical norms and averages. So the worry isn't just that it gets cold and natural gas prices spike. The worry is that it gets cold and gas prices spike and oil subsequently becomes scarce. Um, but yeah, the weather forecast changes daily, Mike. Um, <laughs> it's It dropped 10% today on, on a warm outlook, both here and in Europe. So uh, <laughs> it's a mixed bag at this point, frankly. You know, we've just bought into $90 power for next year for Stetson. But there really is a floor um, under things. You know, we had $150 a megawatt hour last January, which was a fairly cold January, not extremely, but fairly cold. And then the February after it was much closer to normal. It might have skewed a little warm. And uh, I wish I had a better memory of this, but prices were not that high. They, I'm not going to quote you a number, but they were lower. So anyhow... I think that's indicative for this year too, subject to two big things, the oil inventories are low and the Ukraine war is ongoing. So the upside risk remains very high, uh, but I have a hard time seeing winter prices settling down below a hundred bucks, even okay. with warm weather. Uh, you know, this week's a good example. You know, this isn't particularly cold. We're highs in the thirties and we are LMPs, if you're watching them, are <laughs> well deep, deep, deep into the hundreds today and throughout the week. Um, and I want to reiterate one more thing we did to mitigate risk because uh, it's a good story. We took Project 10, our oil-fired peaker, and we split it up between the reserve market, which is where it earns most of its revenue, and the energy market for this winter. So if it gets extremely cold, we have full oil tanks up there, and the last 10 megawatts of that unit have been held back to hedge energy risk. So if prices spike above their fuel cost, roughly 300 bucks. Uh, Project 10 can be expected to um, mitigate some of those uh, those costs. So you have uh, roughly 10% of remembering right share. Yep, 10%. And that's about a megawatt of coverage there at a $300 price threshold in case it gets uh, dicey out there. Well, what, what is the megawatt price from uh, McNeil? Oh, geez. All in, McNeil's probably a hundred well fuel cost versus all in cost <laughs> fuel cost is probably 80 bucks right now megawatt hour it's kind of high you, normally it's down around 65 
Ken, you might have this off the top of your head. I didn't look at the latest. Uh, no, I think you're pretty close, like seven and a half to eight cents a kilowatt hour, yeah. 75 to $80 a megawatt hour. And they're, they've been stockpiling wood for the last couple of months. They're anticipating around the clock run pretty much from uh, right up from January 1st on through March. So they're assuming the plant doesn't develop a tube leak or something there. That'll be there for coverage. That's a pretty good hedge. Yeah, the nice thing about Project 10 is, is we're, we're making enough reserve revenue as if we were bidding all 40 megawatts in the previous year. So we're kind of holding that reserve budget up and getting a little benefit from holding it back for energy hedging purposes. So I like the way we're set up. Um, so big, big picture on the budget, um, going from a $3.8 million budget in 2022, and you're already $150,000 over this. So uh, keep this in mind, and we're going up 8% budget year on budget year. That's actually less than that, because you're going to end the year over budget here in 2022. Uh, for many of the same reasons you're seeing this budget number 23, it's primarily the energy market. Uh, Load is going down about 3%. And that's me looking at your 2022 year to date actuals. Uh, your load's about 3% uh, lower than we forecasted it to be a year ago. And so I'm, you know, bringing you back into alignment uh, with current trends there. And uh, like I said, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, Lynn, I've worked real hard to get everybody's hedge ratio about 100%. We're not biasing to the high side or the low side for the coming five years. Um, In terms of pictures, um, this is much the same picture you saw in the memo that you approved a few minutes ago. On a monthly basis, this is really why I wanted to show you this, your coverage ratio floats around throughout the year. 100% feels good annually, but you need to know that it's not 100% in January. It's more like uh, 90 or 88. So, you know, when we do energy coverage uh, for this coming month, we're likely to be buying some market power to get you up within our policy range of 95 to 105. And that reverses in the spring, of course. Uh, you end up with plenty of hydro. Um, and this was really the limiter. I would have loved to gotten you to 100% hedge ratio with Stetson, for instance. But the more Stetson I bought for January made me even longer in April. You yeah. know, so it's kind of this push-pull. You got to balance those two. Um, so anyway, this is the shape of things going forward. So even with those contract expirations I mentioned in the uh, middle of 24, you still kind of got the same trend both seasonally and annually for your hedge ratio. <clears throat> and then lastly, capacity, you're, you've just got a great looking capacity portfolio. You're very closely matched between supply and demand. And, um, you know, the reason that yellow line's moving around on you is, is about the load. You know, peak loads just uh, have a lot of variance in them, not unique to you. And you had a, a higher peak this past summer than the previous year had had. Um, one more For hardwick and i think this is true i mean half the members have the hydro plants behind the meter that makes your capacity uh demand numbers a little more bouncy because when you have a good hydro year and you have water at the time of the peak you tend to have lower resulting peaks that affect the next year and if you have a year without water then you see the peaks jump because you didn't have the generation behind the meter Yeah, I love this stuff. But forecasting energy is is a, a very as a task you can accomplish with a expectation of success. Forecasting peaks is a whole more much more difficult task for reasons Ken mentioned and others. There's just a lot of variability there. Um, Does the variability would go down if we ultimately get some DeLorean battery? Yes, actually, I would expect them to be a. a effective at hitting the monthly and annual peak. You know, that's, we just talked to them this afternoon and I know you're going to speak with them early next year. Uh, yeah, so I would expect to get that more certain with the battery. I should caveat that short-term versus long-term though. In the short-term, definitely. Long-term, 
the whole world's going to have a battery <laughs> and we're all going to be competing with each other to set whatever peak happens. Yeah. But. Long term, we're all going to be fusion and we're not going to have any batteries. <laughs> not in our lifetime. No, long term. Um, Sean, so uh, the, the slide that you had up before um, that had the budgeted figures and that had that yellow call, that one, yeah. So the, the 41 <laughs> Eight in round numbers shows up in the cost of service study on the pro forma cost of service. But the 2021 figure, maybe somebody said, is, is different. <laughs> Good catch, yes. So yeah, that's 2021 actuals as, as the VEPSA books have it. The Hardwick audited financials, as Ken was trying to describe, the uh, Transco uh, credits. So we okay. borrow money on your behalf, we buy equity, and we make the spread between the cost of debt and the payment <laughs> we get from equity. And that generates, uh, what was it, $130,000. That got characterized for audit purposes as a power supply credit or cost, actually. And um, anyway, there's some bucketing to be done there uh, through the rate case. And um, for power supply purposes, the way I'm showing it to you tonight and the way I view it as an analyst that Transco credit never shows up on my radar. It's usually on a different section of the, of the books. So yeah, there's a presentation difference uh, between the rate case and this budget on that point. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you, Sean. This was, this was edifying. So the next item on our agenda is a discussion with, with Brooke. Um, so I thank the VEPSA folks. Thank you. Well, thank you. All the good time and good work and um, have a very happy holiday, whatever you celebrate. Thank you all. Good night. Yeah, okay, so Brooke is going to talk to us about our Woodbury land. Let me let me make a motion. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, I would like to move that we go into executive session to discuss a potential litigation matter with council, the premature disclosure of which could prejudice the interests of the Hardwick Electric Department. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? So the motion passes. So it is 7.08 PM. And as soon as the recording is stopped, we will be in executive session. Thank you, Thank you. It is 7.54 p.m. and we are out of executive session. No action was taken. Next item on the agenda is- Thank you, Brooke. Thanks, Brooke. Have a good night, guys. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Um, this is general manager's report. Um, did anybody have any questions? No. Okay. But I have one question. Are we getting any feedback or hearing anything from our linemen about other places? Since you're saying some people are leaving. And lost. So I, I was, I can speak a little bit to that. So I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that uh, Green Mountain Power just settled their new bargaining agreement. And they did the exact same numbers as us. They did a 10% wage adjustment and a followed by a 5%. So the, the um, difference between us before our wage increase is going to land at the same gaps we had before, which I think are competitive and, and good. Um, beyond that, Vermont Electric Co-op is still negotiating right now. Um, Yeah, and I, Green Mountain Power was the one I was worried about because if they got a huge increase, that would have stirred a lot of change, but they didn't. 
So it's mm -hmm. good news. That's good. Um, takes us to the financial statements. Any questions? Any other business? I'll just oh. share one other comment uh, just for just for gossip's sake. The, uh, the Green Mountain Power contract got uh, approved because 170 of the bargaining unit members are linemen. And every request that the line workers put into the negotiations was met by Green Mountain Power. Mm. None of the other uh, groups, meter readers, system controllers, et cetera, et cetera, got the same wage increases, nor did they get a bunch of caveats such as, oh, now if you're a lineman and you're in charge of four uh, tree contractor linemen, you get a uh, upgrade up to foreman's rate uh, at time and a half while you supervise them. So a bunch of little things like that they added in. So there's some huge animosity going on between different sectors of the bargaining unit over there right now. Did you say they had 170 linemen? Yeah. Wow. I yeah, mean, we had a hot, at CV. They cover most of the state. Yeah, when I was at CVPS, we had 110. So they only had, they brought 60 to the combined company. Yeah. Where do, where do we stand on negotiations with DeLorean or BEPSA does? Uh, we're, we're doing our own thing, not with BEPSA. And Mike is just waiting for me to tell him, yep, this is a good meeting for you to come to. Obviously, the last couple, we haven't had time for him. Okay. We should try, depending upon what we have on the agenda, because I have a sense we may have a special meeting before our next regular meeting that um, maybe by the next regular meeting we could do it. I don't I want think to see so. things slide for a long time if we don't. Yeah. And if it's not going to happen with them, then we need to be looking elsewhere. Yep. Elsewhere. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion we adjourn for the evening. And it looks Second. like Matt seconded. Yeah. It is uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, come on. You got another hour in you, don't you? <laughs> no. I have to fill up my glass again if I get another hour. Um. <laughs> I'm hungry. I want, I want my dinner. <laughs> hey, hey, Beth, you're going to love it back in Vermont. We got tons of snow. It's just glorious. It's beautiful. It's Bring beautiful. Your parka. It's beautiful. I know. I, I, I actually miss it. I really do. <laughs> it's good to hear. <laughs> oh, one, one, one thing I should share is, you know, we got clobbered with that snowstorm. Uh, when I got up in the morning, about five o'clock Saturday, we had a thousand customers out. Mm -hmm. And within an hour we had 600 of them back on and within five hours we had everybody back on guys, i was going to ask you what happened because i was out for one minute yeah guys I really on, i know that i was out was because my computer was was off when i went to put it on saturday morning yeah they our guys really kicked some butt it was it was it was bad stow um a big chunk of stow was was out for quite a few quite a while um yeah no the roads were were bad i have to say the hardwick road crews get get the roads plowed and they you know they, they keep them clear coming through greensboro and craftsbury friday night after going to the play at, at highland arts it's a good thing there was no traffic because there was only one set of tracks in, in, the, <laughs> in the road it took me 40 minutes whoa wow. Woo. Well, I wasn't going to come down center road. The thought of going down Slap Hill at that yeah, no. was, oh, was not always, attractive. They always salt Slap Hill. Yeah, well. <laughs> so, Mike, how does how does that work on well, when you get a big storm like that? Who decides what and, and how does it start? So uh, the guys handle everything unless we have 250 or more customers out then i come in and i be the general and i interact with crc and i tell crews you got 
a hundred customers out over here. That's your next one. The next one, there's 20 customers out over here. That'll be next 10 here. You go biggest to smallest. So you get the biggest bang for your buck earliest, but below 250, the guys just handle it with CRC. So we, uh, whoever is on duty that night, that day. Yeah. And they, you know, if they, if Rusty and Nick are out working on a hundred customer outage with wires down and we have two other calls and they're going to be three hours fixing that, they'll call in another crew to go get the other stuff. Good. It works pretty, works pretty good. And uh, this storm was pretty proof of the pudding. Okay. Well, it is 8.01 PM. And I think we already voted on a motion to adjourn. So we are adjourned. Um, okay, thank you. Have wonderful holidays, holidays and yes. uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, I guess.